Okay. Okay. There's two more coming in. Okay. I'm going to start. So hello everyone. Welcome to our second online No to NATO, Yes to Peace online protest webinar. Since we can't be on the streets, we take to the internet and attract more people from across Canada to, to establish a movement we can take back to more streets. My co-host Tamara Lawrence will have more information on that soon and what NATO is all about. I want to welcome our amazing guest, Ray Atchison, who is the director of Reaching Critical Will and the disarmament program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We are here tonight to talk about her section written with Madeleine Reese in the latest occupational paper entitled Rethinking Unconstrained Military Spending on the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs and how a feminist approach would change what needs to be changed, focusing on Canada's position and, the NATO, and NATO's influence on military spending. Please make sure you are muted, as will I, and please post any questions or comments in the chat box that I will note and keep for the question and answer at the end of the discussion. If we get any Zoom bomber invading, I will send out another link through who is registered so we can continue. We are also recording this and will be on YouTube after for all to watch and refer to. Now I first welcome my colleague, Vanessa, who is our national coordinator of VAL with organization updates and notes. Then Tamara will introduce why we oppose NATO and our discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I did see a couple of comments. Are, are we able to hear each other yet? Is there audio? We can hear? Everyone's okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa Wheel, for organizing this webinar and all the work you do as the Canadian Voice of Women's Ontario Coordinator and to our amazing speakers, Tamara Lawrence and Ray Atchison. Uh, we are so thankful to all of you and thank you so much for speaking with us today, which is sure to be an incredibly informative webinar on the issue of militarism, our spending priorities and security needs. My name is Vanessa Lantain and I'm the National Coordinator for the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. We are very excited to be hosting the No to NATO, Yes to Peace webinars, as we have had to adapt, like many other organizations, to the current realities of our advocacy work. Uh, for example, next week we would have been traveling to Ottawa for a week-long peace conference to join our partners World Beyond War, among others, to protest North America's largest military weapons trade show called CANSEC and to host a reception on Parliament Hill with Senator Mary Lou McFedrin's office and a gala dinner fundraiser to celebrate 60 years of anti-war activism by the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. So much of the power of our organization is the ability to mobilize people to visibly protest concerns about our peace and security priorities. We have now adapted to continue our work virtually through webinars like this one, and I know our, par our partners are currently doing the same, such as moving the Ottawa Peace Conference online. So our goals at the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is to build a resilient culture of peace through education, advocacy, and collaboration, and by raising women's voices on the issues of peace and security. We can see the, throughout the world right now that the response of women to this crisis shows effective leadership in areas of governance, economics, and healthcare, among, among others, everywhere from the home to the highest levels of government and business. And we must continue our progress of women's representation and ensure that feminist perspectives are included to ensure a green, just, and resilient recovery and not go back to normal, but go forward to better. So I am so excited. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in with us on this Tuesday afternoon. If you are anywhere near the Toronto area, I'm delighted to introduce Tamara Lawrence, a Rotary Peace Fellow and current PhD candidate at Wilfrid Laurier and prominent member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my slides with you. So it'll just take a second to get that up for you.
Can everybody see my slides all right? Um, yes, could you put me on video or everyone else is on video? Joan Russo. Oh, no. You should, it should be at the bottom of your screen. There we go, I can ask to start video oh. for you. Where's that? Oh. Bottom of the screen, share screen, share screen? No. No. Um, over more to the left, there should be a start video. Start video, I can't see it. Oh, there it is, oh yeah, okay. There we go, welcome. I'm gonna mute you now Hi. so you can continue. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. <laughs> Melissa, can I start? Can everybody yeah. see my slides? Yep. Great. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today on No Tomato, Yes to Peace. In my brief introductory remarks, I'm going to talk to you about why the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW, is opposed to NATO and talk a little bit about military spending and NATO's 2% GDP target. I'd like to begin with a tweet that Canadian General Jonathan Vance sent out last Thursday. And he wrote in his tweet, the business of NATO continues. He's talking about the big chief of defense staff uh, meeting that, that NATO held last week. And if you look carefully at his tweet, you can see a picture of all of the NATO members, chief of defense, and it's a picture of all men. It's military men that decide the business of NATO. It's military men that decide NATO's operations, its missions, its activities, and its policies. And so this is why the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is opposed to NATO. Last year, we launched a campaign Feminists Against Militarism, Women Say No to NATO. This is a picture of all of us with our, with our signs outside the gala that was put on by the NATO Association of Canada. They have an office in downtown Toronto and they had their big annual gala last fall. And the featured speakers were former Liberal Prime Minister Paul Martin and former Defence Minister Peter McKay. But we were out on the streets protesting. So the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace opposes NATO for a variety of reasons. It's an aggressive military alliance. It's an institution that's patriarchal, that's violent. If you look at its Cold War record over the past 30 years, it's been involved in illegal military interventions. It relies on a dangerous nuclear deterrence. It undermines the United Nations, among many other reasons. Today, we're going to focus on uh, NATO and its pressure to on members to increase military spending to 2% of GDP by 2024. So last December at the NATO summit in London, the, the members released a declaration. And I'm just going to read one paragraph of this declaration. And it says, so these are all of the NATO members, including Canada, and this is the commitment that they made uh, last December. We are determined to share the costs and responsibilities of our individual security. Through our defense investment pledge, we are increasing our defense investment line with its 2% on of GDP and 20% guidelines. That refers to the expenditure on equipment, investing in new capabilities and contributing more forces to missions and operations. Non-US defense expenditure has grown for five consecutive years to over 130 billion US dollars more is being invested in defense. In line with our commitment as enshrined in Article 3 of the Washington Treaty, we continue to strengthen our individual and collective capacity to resist all forms of attack. We are making good prog progress. We must and will do more. Every year, NATO releases its annual defense expenditure report. And you can go to the website and you can find this report. It's about 20 pages. And in that report, it gives detail about the military spending for all of its 29, now 30 members. But this is for last 
this is the latest defense expenditure report for 2019. And this is a chart from that report. And you can see that this is ranking the NATO members by their GDP percentage that they spend on defense. And you can see that that the United States spends way more than the NATO guideline of 2% at 3.8%. You can see the green line there across the middle and all of the members. And at the red arrow is Canada. Canada is ranked 20th. We spend 1.3% of GDP on defense. And often in the media and by the defense establishment, Canada is criticized for only spending 1.3%. We haven't reached this NATO 2% target. You know, we're not even in the top 10 among all NATO members. But actually, if you look in that report and you were to look on a cash basis, the actual amount of money that Canada spends on defense, among the 29 NATO members, we actually are ranked sixth highest for military expenditures. Now, last month, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute released their annual Trends in World Military Expenditure Report. And in that report, they have this chart. And you can see this is the ranking of top spenders on the military. The United States is number one at $732 billion. And then you can see Canada is ranked 14th at $22 billion. That's in US dollars. And among the top 15 spenders on the military, six are NATO members and four are NATO partners. So NATO dominates for military spending. Now, if you want to look more closely into military spending in Canada, um, you can you can look at the public accounts of Canada and you can see this website here. It, you have the current report for 2019 and you can look at the archives. Well, if you look at the current report, Table 2A, you can see a, a, rank, a, a list of all of the major federal departments. There's National Defense. And you can see if you scroll across, we spent $31.7 billion on the military, on national defense last year. Now, what I did within this chart is I went and uh, through the public, the archives of the public accounts, and I charted defense spending from 1997 to 2019. And you can see this dramatic growth, growth of military spending. I also included the orange line. This is public safety. This is our paramilitary forces, this is RCMP, Border Patrol, and Correctional Services. And then I also included the departmental spending for fisheries, natural resources, and environment and climate change Canada. And you can see those green blue lines at the bottom, and they've effectively flatlined at about a billion dollars for the past 20 years, even though we know the ecological crisis is getting worse. In this chart, I just showed you know how much more that the military department of national defense gets uh, you know, to these other departments and i included indigenous and northern affairs which is now a com combination of crown indigenous relations and indigenous services at four billion dollars so of, of all the federal departments national defense gets so much more and i also included the new department called women and gender equality i mean that doesn't that's not even a you can barely even see that. So uh, just a, a few quick points to close on federal spending. So the Department of National Defense last year was $31 billion. Now of that $31 billion, $135 million was for the NATO alliance. And if you look at the Department of of women and gender equality wage, their total departmental budget was $72 million. I mean, this is, this is about half, how much, half as much we spend for NATO. And then I also looked at uh, spending for the status of women. Now it's called the Department of Women and Gender Equality over the, the, over the past 20 years. And I totaled all of that spending from 1997 until t today, and it's $657 million. Um, but that is almost equivalent to what the Canadian government has spent to participate on the 
the US F-35 fighter jet consortium. I, I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. And then to close a few other points to make, the Senate has pushed for more military spending repeatedly. There is no politician or political party in Canada that will call for a reduction of military spending. And there is no politician or political party that will call for the cancellation of the new fighter jets. Um, with all of this money that the Department of National Defense has, it is not doing peacekeeping. Right now, Canada is ranked uh, 77 in the world for peacekeepers. We only have 35 soldiers out of our you know, nearly 69,000 soldiers that we have in this country. Only 35 of them are doing peacekeeping. So we are not doing peacekeeping. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention this article that I recently published in Ricochet online magazine to cancel the fighter jets because of the COVID crisis and and climate change. There are peaceful alternatives to NATO. These, this is international law and, our, and these incredible institutions like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, among many others. We can talk about this more in the discussion. Canadian Voice of Women wants to build a national movement against NATO for all of the reasons that I've just outlined, and we can discuss this more as well. And then these are some resources that uh, I'd be happy to share, that I'm going to share with you. We will send out the slides, and, we uh, and I look forward to the discussion and hearing from Ray. Thanks. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, and now we welcome Ray Atchison with her amazing wisdom and knowledge on the feminist approach with military spending and all the connections. Thank you, Ray. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And thanks so much for sharing all of that information and doing that research, Tamara. I'm always so impressed by the level of detail that you can unearth that the rest of us can then use in our in our work as well it's so important to be doing that and um, exposing the the myths of the canadian government amongst others um, of course we have this image especially here i'm in new york and living in the us and um, there's definitely some misconceptions about Canada that I have to keep correcting um, while living here. So um, appreciate your help in doing that. So I'm going to talk less about NATO today and more about military spending in general um, and militarism and the military industrial complex. But of course, it's all relevant to the work that Vow and other groups in Canada are doing against um, NATO and those commitments of, of 2% that you were talking about. Um, I wanted to start from one of the points that you raised in your uh, remarks, Tamara, about the latest CIPRI report and the, the finding that um, military spending has risen yet again um, to $1.9 trillion approximately uh, in, in 2019. And this is just a staggering figure for any of us to try and comprehend, of course. Um, so I kind of wanted to look at how we got here and, and what this means in our current moment. Um, and you mentioned that article uh, that I've written um, for the UNODA occasional paper on military spending. And it's interesting because that was supposed to actually come out uh, last October um, during the UN General Assembly First Committee on Disarmament. Um, and instead they decided to, to release it in two publications. So the first one is kind of a history on UN efforts against military spending. And the second edition is, is these activist perspectives. But it's great that it got postponed and to come out um, both at the same time as the new CIPRI figures were released, but also in this moment of the coronavirus and is having this opportunity to really contrast what it is that we are spending our money on and what we have prepared for collectively as societies. Um, it's so clear that uh, the culture of militarism is deeply embedded in our political capitalist economies. Um, but also in our conceptions and the way that we organize for international relations, 
in our understandings of security, of what security means and, and how it works and whose security matters, um, and also throughout our daily lives. Um, it's also important, I think, to note at the outset that the culture of militarism is deeply gendered. And Madeline and I wrote about that um, in our feminist perspectives piece for the UNODA publication. Um, militarism creates and reproduces social norms of gender, particularly in the context of what it is to be quote unquote a real man, um, which in the military mindset is really a violent protector of women and children. And I say women and children um, as one word grouped together because um, apparently uh, we have the same capacities and, and um, obligations um, in the way that it's talked about. Um, so I think all this is really important to help us understand how ingrained it is in not just economy, but in our lives and in our understandings of, of security. Um, this culture necessitates weapons, it necessitates war, um, and the economy does as well, the political economy of violence and of militarism. The argument goes, of course, there will all, always be those who uh, want the capacity to wield power through violence and therefore the rational actors need to retain the weapons for the protection against others. Um, and this posits those of us who are proponents to alternatives to militarism as being emotional and unrealistic and irrational and all of that is highly gendered as well in the way it's um, discussed and in the way that ideas, alternative ideas uh, are dismissed. All of this clouds our minds and it limits our imaginations of what might be possible so that even in the midst of a pandemic in New York City, which is the hardest hit city by COVID-19 at the moment, where doctors and nurses are wearing raincoats and bandanas instead of of proper protective gear, the military did a flyover a few weeks ago with their $20 million jets to thank the frontline medical workers, uh, wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars of fuel. So the fact that that could happen and seem like a reasonable action um, in this moment just shows how deeply embedded militarism is in our lives. Um, during the COVID-19 crisis, of course, in many countries, arms producers have been deemed essential services and they have been continuing to manufacture weapons during this time. Um, major military contractors like Boeing and others here in the US successfully pushed for billions in aid to the arms industry in the $2 trillion US stimulus bill that was released. Um, the U.S. government has been very clear that uh, nuclear weapon modernization projects are on track um, right now because that's what we're worried about. Um, last year, uh, the nine nuclear armed states spent almost $73 billion on nuclear weapons. Um, that was just released in a report from the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Um, most of that money was spent in the US. Um, and also, it's not just the nuclear weapon modernization that's on track, but we've been assured several times now, don't worry, uh, they can still launch their nuclear weapons during this crisis, so we're okay. Um, so again, the idea that, that this is what uh, people are concerned about or that they believe people are concerned about um, shows us how deeply embedded militarism is um, in our lives. Um, I also wanted to talk about the arms trade in this context. So I think probably all of you or most of you know that the UN Secretary General called for a global ceasefire um, a few months ago now at the start of this crisis. Um, which is a great initiative and there's been a lot of support from local activists, uh, particularly within countries that are currently in conflict. Um, but at the same time, arms production and sales are still continuing. Like I said, the um, arms producers have been deemed essential services, etc. Um, and so while there's all this global support for laying down weapons in the battlefield, 
um, there's still plenty of actors that are willing to sell weapons to those same battlefields. Um, and a great example of this is Canada, um, which announced that it would lift the temporary restrictions that it had previously imposed on future arms sales to Saudi Arabia at the same time that it announced support for the UN Secretary General's ceasefire appeal. Um, so it was already continuing with its original deal that's raised a lot of controversy, but it had uh, agreed to undertake a review on any future deals, and now it has said, um, no, nope, we're all good to continue selling weapons to, to Saudi Arabia. Um, countries like the United Kingdom and France have also been very vocally supportive of the ceasefire, um, and yet these countries are not being supportive in a constructive way of efforts to um, stop the use of weapons in conflict. So right now the Irish government is leading an international process to try to um, uh, uh, stop the use of explosive weapons in populated areas in conflicts around the world. And the UK and France are trying to undermine this initiative um, by getting it to focus on on other things or watering down the language. And so it's, um, it's, it's important to pay attention, not just to the lip service that's paid to a single initiative, but also to account for what these governments are really doing elsewhere um, in ways that impact uh, human lives. Um, another thing that uh, Wilf has been trying to draw attention to during this, um, this crisis and, and other groups as well, including Project Plowshares in Canada, very vocally, um, is our concern with investments in future weapons and also other violent technologies that you might not consider um, to be uh, weapons, but the way that they are used certainly uh, could be. Um, considered that. So in the midst of the coronavirus conflict, we've had lots of rollouts of new surveillance um, technology uh, and also drones used in new ways um, to help with contact tracing and quarantine and also cleaning public spaces. But the questions are where does this end? What happens after to these technologies? And what does the development of these or use of these specific technologies in these context mean for um, their future use. So along with our concern about the growing digital panopticon, the idea that our governments can, can have our, uh, access to the data on our phone and our locations um, and surveil us in public spaces and, and in our homes, um, there's also additionally the investments in the militarization of a lot of this technology of artificial intelligence and autonomous technologies um, that could be used later on to develop autonomous weapon systems or killer robots. Um, so we also have to pay attention in this way to new military contractors. We're all used to dealing with the Lockheed Martins and the Boeings and the Bechtels and the Raytheons, um, but now companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Google are getting Pentagon contracts. Um, a lot of it is to use their existing cloud computing software or their other developments of algorithms and, and technology in military systems. Um, and there's going to be more and more investments uh, along the lines of autonomous weapon systems in the future with these companies. So it's not just the traditional military contractors we need to be keeping track of, it's also the big and the small tech firms as well. So that paints probably a bit of a grim picture, um, but we are activists and so we are here to create change in the world. And actually, I'm really hopeful, despite all of this that I've just described and that Tamara's described in terms of, of NATO, um, because around the world right now in this moment, it does feel that people are starting to ask, how could our governments have been so unprepared for this crisis? Where has our money actually gone? Where have our tax dollars been going? Um, is this capitalist system really working for us? Is this system of prioritizing militarism above all else really working for us? Um, and what else could the money have been spent on? So there's been a lot of great um, new information coming out, people doing research and contrasting costs of things. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few, but there's so many. Uh, the global campaign on military spending has shown that one F-35 
uh, Joint Strike Fighter aircraft could pay for 3,244 intensive care unit beds, or that one submarine could pay for over 9,000 fully equipped ambulances. Um, ICANN has shown that a year's worth of current investments in nuclear weapons in each country that has them could pay for hundreds of thousands of medical workers, ventilators, protective gear, and much more. Um, we know that more jobs could be created through investments in a Green New Deal and a Red Deal than are currently created by military spending, and that such investments would also help us mitigate the climate crisis, which we're also in the midst of, and improve the lives of billions of people and everyone else living on our planet. Um, and at the same time that this information is being unearthed and even getting coverage in, in mainstream media, um, uh, CNN and The Guardian and others picked up the most recent ICANN report, for example, um, at the same time that the military spending is being critiqued and analyzed, um, more generally people are also speaking out against capitalism and speaking in favor of and forming new mutual aid networks and um, other community-based solidarity efforts. So this is really an opportunity for us to reorient ourselves and our societies uh, and to seize this moment working together. A few ideas um, that relate to the militarism bit of this um, that, are, that are important in my opinion. Um, cutting military spending of course is extremely important. Um, there was an op-ed in Time Magazine recently by Mikhail Gorbachev calling for a 15% cut. Um, that's great, but 15% does not get us to where we need to be. Um, so much more um, is important. And also ending this 2% for militarism mantra, that has to be stopped as well. Um, but also there's other things that need to go along with cutting military spending. Um, like uh, we need to stop militarism from being included in official development assistance or in international financial institution aid packages. Um, you know, these, these agreements that force uh, developing countries receiving funds to spend a certain amount on um, buying military equipment um, and from implementing policies that exacerbate insecurities that then cause the government to look to militarism as a solution. Um, we also need to look at the multilateral system and what's working and what's not working. Uh, the UN Security Council has been described by virtually everyone at this point as being missing in action during this crisis. It cannot get its act together um, on any aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the UN General Assembly has been stepping up to take some actions, uh, but needs to do much more. So one thing it could do in regards to militarism is taking up the mandate from the UN Charter, uh, from Article 26 of the UN Charter, to formulate a plan for disarmament and for divestment from military spending um, and broader demilitarization negotiations. Um, the UN could revive its work on military spending that it used to engage in. Um, it had great projects that it ran during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, pointing out the social costs of militarism. Um, and all of that's described in the UNODA occasional paper. And I think that that is really crucial to revive. Um, ending the privatization of military production to take the profiteering out of war is really crucial. And Wilf, this is something Wolf's been calling for since our founding in 1915 um, in where we found the, the main impediment to peace to be the private profits occurring from war. Um, also centering feminist and anti-racist and decolonial perspectives in our work for disarmament and demilitarization, um, centering the perspectives of people that are actually affected by uh, the use of weapons the most, um, and those who have had less say in designing this current system of inequality and, and military priority. And all of that might sound like a lot or not enough, um, and we can discuss uh, other options and initiatives and campaigns and work that needs to be done. But I think at the end of the day, the most important thing that we can do ourselves and collectively is believe that change is possible. Because we're always told that change is impossible, that we're naive dreamers, and that we don't understand reality and how the world works and all that. 
I'm sure everyone on this call has heard that a million times. Um, but the systems that currently dominate our world were also once considered radical. I think that's important to, to think about that neo neoliberalism used to be a weird concept. Um, and then it became the dominant system that rules our political economy today. Um, and also everything that we've achieved so far in the world for social good has come from radical dreamers who worked for change relentlessly and didn't give up. Um, we never know when things will shift or when opportunities will arise. Um, and as devastating as this crisis is and has been on so many lives and will continue to be for years to come, um, I think that we do need to take these cracks uh, and shifts in the system and in a public opinion that we are seeing and make the most out of those opportunities. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Um, there's more subjects to discuss and, and more ideas to pursue, but happy to, to have some Q&A at this point, I think, is that right, Melissa? Uh, yep, yep, if you're, if you're done, we can move on to that. Um, I noticed a, uh, if you have a question too, you can use the raise your hand feature and you can, uh, you can put you in queue to speak. Um, but I did notice that Catherine had several questions. Um, so Catherine, if you wanted to take the floor and ask some of your questions. Thank you. I, uh, Ray, in your article, you wrote that uh, in the UN Charter, that there was a section that said that there was restricting the amount of military spending uh, was, uh, was indicated in diversion in, in the diversion of human and economic resources for arms. So does Canada have something similar that there's a, are there any limiting factors to military spending? Is there, a, is there even a narrative of too much was 10 years ago? Thank you. Um, not that I know of specific to Canada. Um, Tamara might know if those discussions have taken place or not um, within Canada, but, um, within the UN, yes, in the UN Charter in Article 26, um, there is a provision that states that the UN Security Council was supposed to come up with a plan, um, formulate a plan for um, ensuring the least, um, the least spending, basically, the least diversion of human and economic resources on militarism. But they never did that. Um, they have not undertaken that. So that's why one of the things that... Um, we're suggesting at WILF is that the UN General Assembly take this up, take up the mandate of Article 26 um, and start to formulate this plan, which would include disarmament, divestment, demilitarization. Thank you. Tamara, do you have any comments or any questions on your end? There is no policy that I have seen from Canada that restricts military spending. As you can see from my chart, it's been going up and up and up, and we don't have any political opposition to that. The Greens, the NDP, the Liberals, Conservatives, of course, you know, support the military and military spending, and we really have to turn it around. If, if it were possible to have it proportional to the violence of domestic violence, uh, women's groups would be funded much higher than they are right now or to violence in general in terms of um, militarized masculinities or weaponized masculinities so maybe that's proportional representation in that way thank you uh, i see a hand from joan as well welcome you can you can ask your question Got to unmute. There we go. Oh, Sorry. Okay. One of the things that we could lobby for is the fact that the military budget is now tied to the very flawed way of, of assessing value, economic value, the, the GDP. Because the, as far as I know, and you could help me probably tomorrow, as far as I know, the GDP, well, the GDP always was the way that the military said it always has to be linked to the GDP. And the activists always want, not wanted this. 
but one of the problems with the GDP is the GDP goes up every time there's a disaster. So when there's an environmental disaster, the GDP would go up. So this means that the, the military budget will continually go up if, I'm, if we don't deal with emergencies and disasters. Does that make any sense, Tamara? That because um, I know it was they always the military always wanted it firmly linked to the GDP, probably because they knew that every time there's a disaster happening, which they contribute to, the GDP will go up and the military budget will go up. But for years, it was never linked to. This is the first time it's been linked to the GDP, as far as I know. Yes, that's what I tried to show in my presentation that it's. It's NATO that has this defense investment pledge that all members must increase military spending to 2% of GDP by 2024. So they made that commitment at the Wales Summit in 2014, and they reaffirmed that commitment at their London Summit last December. And I showed you that quote. Um, and this is exactly the problem. They use this 2% GDP figure because it doesn't sound like very much. It's only 2%. But as I showed from my slides, that this is a, a huge amount of money. What the, the GDP for the Department of Environment and Climate Change is 0.08%. You, you know, it, it's a, a fraction of what we're spending on the military. So. I think that NATO and the Canadian government uses the GDP target, you know, as a ruse. It doesn't sound like very much, so it shouldn't scare Canadians. But what, what we're telling you uh, and showing with our research is that this is a tremendous amount of money. And if we increase to 2% of GDP over the next decade, we're, we're looking at, you know, $45 billion being spent at on the military at such a critical time this next decade you know we are trying to meet as an international community the paris agreement to try to reduce carbon emissions and we're trying to achieve the un sustainable development goals and that both of those big security agendas are going to require a tremendous amount of financial resources so we we cannot be spending it on the military. We need to be spending it on sustainability and on uh, uh, protecting the climate, on caring for people and caring for planet, not for planning for war. And this is just as really, it's got to stop. And it's going to require all of us working together really hard to do that. So I'm really, um, I'd love to hear your ideas about, you know, what more we can do in Canada and, and more of your questions. Thanks. Could I ask you, well, could you respond to what I said? Is that not something we can use to show the absurdity of it being linked in any way to the GDP? They've been trying this for years. It's not just the 2%. This has been going on for years where the military has been pushing this. But is this not something we could use to show the absurdity of it? Is that when the GDP, especially at this time with the coronavirus, the GDP will be going up tremendously because there's a disaster. Isn't that the, the, the terrible link with, and problem with the GDP? That whenever there's an environmental disaster, the GDP goes up. So that means the military budget will be continually increasing. I think, I think that would be an argument that we could use. What do you think? I, Anyone? <laughs> yes, I agree. Uh, do other people have comments or reflections on anything that Ray or I discussed? Can I say that I wonder if, ha, is there any point to sending this information that you put together to um, Tamara, to, to the NDP, for instance, and getting them to be the light. I, I know it's kind of naive of me, but I, I keep hoping that the NDP will understand. And the other question is about all these recovery programs now that we are getting um, in our email, you know, true reco uh, green recovery, true recovery. And um, what was the other one? Uh, 
anyway, Green New Deal. They're not mentioning military. I don't hear, I don't see it in any of their plans to, to um, you know, shift funding. Do you, do you have any ideas as to how we could use, how we could influence those? Or does anybody have any idea? When I was the leader of the Green Party of Canada, we called for at least a 50% reduction of the military budget. And I, I, I think it's something, I think right now it's been slightly changed, but there is, there is a leadership uh, uh, com competition right now. So this is a good time to really push the Green Party to do something about it. Because that was, uh, for years that was policy when I was there anyway, that at least 50%, and that isn't, of course, that isn't enough, but at least that was something. I'll just add that uh, 12 years ago, I had a private meeting with the late Jack Layton, the leader of the Green Party. I mean, sorry, the leader of the New Democratic Party, the NDP at the time, sorry. Um, and I, I had a private meeting with him and I showed him all the documents and I said, you know, Jack, please, you know, we've got to deal with this issue of military spending. And he said, I'm not going to do anything on military spending unless there's a huge movement out there pushing me in the right direction. Uh, none of the political parties or the politicians want to tackle the issue of military spending because they don't want to appear to be critical of the military. We don't have anybody in the House of Commons or the Sen Senate asking any hard questions about the military. Really, none of them are, are, are scrutinizing operations, scrutinizing spending. So uh, we, we really need to create uh, a, you know, a, a movement to call for moving the money from the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces to our you know, real human security needs, dealing with affordable housing, health care, education, and the climate crisis. I mean, those are our priorities in this country. And, and of course, you know, meeting our, our international commitments uh, to overseas development assistance, etc. But uh, the, the military is not a priority, and we, we have to stop spending uh, like it is. Mm -hmm. I think also just in response to the question about the Green New Deal and um, and militarism, I agree there hasn't been enough so far, but there have been a few um, a few really good articles about where the money for the Green New Deal should come from, highlighting militarism as a particular um, uh, a particular point. So I I will put those links in the chat um, and also a bit about. Uh, uh, Red Deal as well, which is an indigenous response to the Green New Deal, which builds on those ideas, but also says that decolonization and demilitarization in the context of, of decolonization needs to be an important part. So I'll post some links to, to those two articles that I'm thinking of, um, but if others have other resources on, on that, then please also share. <laughs> Uh, may I just address one question or point that was in uh, the chat? Uh, Ken Stone asked, has anybody talked about Canada out of NATO? I'm sorry if I wasn't clear in my presentation <laughs> that the Canadian Voice of Women's position is Canada out of NATO and the alliance should be abolished. And yes, we, yes. we are, um, you know, wanting to create a national movement to put pressure on the political parties and the government to 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 not support NATO anymore. We want to discredit and delegitimize NATO because NATO is an obstacle to us in so many ways. You know, the focus of this call today is on military spending. It's NATO that's constantly putting pressure on us to increase military spending. As I explained, it's NATO that's keeping us. Uh, entrenched with this terrible, dangerous uh, nuclear uh, weapons deterrence and nuclear weapons modernization. Um, and so this is why there's, there's, it's not possible to reform NATO. NATO, we, we, have to, we have to get out of NATO and NATO needs to be abolished. And, and I'm really proud that, that VOW is an organization that's taking uh, a strong step and it has a very clear and bold position. 
on NATO. I, I welcome other people's comments and thoughts. Mm -hmm. Janice? Um, I'm uh, curious. Um, so my question, I think, is probably directed to Ray, since you have the opportunity um, to be in and around the UN so much more than probably any of the rest of us on this call. In the mid 90s, I think it was, uh, UNESCO um, stood up and expressed a, a program of action to build a culture of peace. And I just wonder what your view is of where that stands today. I, what I mean is the strength of UNESCO's uh, promotion of, of that concept. I, certainly from where I sit, <laughs> there's not much visibility um, internationally. Uh, maybe there is some talk of that within the UN system. I think it's pretty weak here in Canada. Uh, I think it's probably begun in some school structures and um, wherever they set their, their programs. But it seems to me that um, that's something so positive that that we could introduce these ideas that we're talking about now in that kind of framework. So my question really is about, um, in your opinion, the strength of that program, should we be trying to revise that? Because they did set out uh, a program of work within the UN system, which was adopted. Um, what, what do you know about that, Ray, please? Yeah, hi, and it's great to see you. Um, <laughs> yes. Hope you're Thank well. You. Um, Thank you, I am. Um, I, I completely agree with you from where I sit. It is same as you, it's, it seems quite weak. It, um, it pops up now and again. There's um, the occasional um, lip service paid to it uh, by either by NGOs or, or by certain governments. Um, in, but I, it's not something that I think UNESCO has really made um, a big push on to, to make it a very public dominant campaign within the UN system. Um, and it hasn't at this point really gotten the traction. In this moment of crisis when people are uh, critiquing militarism in in new or deeper ways, um, maybe it is an option. But I think um, I don't know enough about the program of action that the that that um, UNESCO put forward um, to say whether it has um, legs that we could work with or or not. Um, but I do think that any initiatives that uh, that we support from from this moment do need to be fierce, I would say. So um, mm. not just using, calling for peace, but um, clear, concrete plans of how to get there, whether that's mm. cutting military spending, abolishing NATO and other military alliances, eliminating foreign military bases, abolishing nuclear weapons, those types of clear, um, things and I wonder, not knowing what's in the program of action, I wonder within the UN system if they would have really come up with those types of clear demands that um, require governments to really take actions that they perceive as going against their own interests in this militarized concept of of security and in the in the culture of war profiteering that we live with today. Um, I think undermining those fundamental systems and structures is essential to, to change at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it might be a vehicle, but we would definitely need to look at it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a point of, I, I don't even know who the new director is of UNESCO, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not current, but um, I, I'll, I'll look into it a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Great. Um, I just, <clears throat> I wanted to say in, in terms of ideas of building a movement, right now it really is key in terms of what generally we haven't been, what hasn't been too much on the radar screen, and that's women's shelters, um, the high numbers of homelessness, although it's been on the uh, radar screen, 
the need for increased food banks and so on. So at the community level, there is um, dialogue being held around the fact that um, uh, post pandemic, um, these the services for as they're referring to to the vulnerable no. um, need to be um, put as priorities. So one idea is to be able to identify those committees here in Nelson. There's the, a very strong committee on homelessness, which, which ha it, it has representatives from approximately 12 or 13 local, um, other local community organizations, women's center, a representative from the city hall and so on. So taking the opportunity, this, speaking to myself as well, um, in in the fall, perhaps, bringing what we've just heard here from Tamara, from Ray, from others, um, the information about um, the uh, um, about military spending. So movement can, to my mind, can be strengthened by dispersing this information by getting it to students, peace groups. Uh, in universities and, and so on, the colleges, the Mir Center for Peace here in Castlegar, um, just having it out there because if it's if it's if people don't know about it, citizens, grassroots, those that are concerned about the issues, um, if they don't know these actual facts and what the plans are for future expansions, then it's it's a hard call. Thanks. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, just, uh, yep. regarding, the, uh, regarding the UN, uh, the UNESCO and UN Culture of Peace, that was initially organized for the first decade of this century millennium. And it was succeeded by the next program of UNESCO, which is a decade for the rapprochement of cultures, trying to see how different perspectives can. Uh, meet and agree to differ. So that is the new focus at UNESCO and uh, certainly needed. I want to bring to your attention because there's so much talk and need for what is economic conversion to actually shift from this war economy to peace. There is a global teach-in that's being organized for next Tuesday, the 26th. It's being organized from Sweden by a man, Jonathan uh, Feldman. And Jonathan was a student of Seymour Melman, and his mission is how to see these current crises as leading to the understanding of how we do economic conversion and a scale enough actually to challenge the war system to create the Green New Deal on a global scale. So I encourage you, and I put in the chat the uh, link to this global uh, teaching. And I think it'd be very beneficial if people who have a particular view on disarmament and challenging the war system. The basic thrust is to democratize the crisis in terms of what's happening with this virus and how social uh, normality has been disrupted. How does this change can be reconstructed to be a benefit for all the people who need it and not to simply re reinforce the uh, elites. So it should be very interesting. There are about uh, 20 different countries involved. And so uh, I put it on the, where, on the chat and you will all be invited to participate. It begins with about an hour and a half of, of international speakers and then each local group will have its own. How do we uh, do, what does this mean in our locale? And then it will come back together from the locales reporting back to the, to the global um, Zoom or uh, uh, stream, and there'll probably be a follow-up in about a month to see what, how are these questions, the difficult questions taken to the next step. So it's an ongoing conversation and very relevant to what's being talked about here. And thank you, Ray, for your presentation. Very good. And, and yes, we need, the, we need the culture of peace. Ray or Tamara, any comments on that? We have another hand and then we'll go to that after you guys have comments. 
Um, just to say that I think these initiatives sound sound great. Um, I think all of the using this time to to do this kind of organizing and education and outreach is so critical. So I'm I'm really happy to hear about this. Uh, Alan, thanks for that. I was just thinking that the Hague Appeal for Peace in 2000 and UNESCO's Culture of Peace Initiative and Decade for Peace for the Children of the World uh, were totally overwhelmed by the US-led global war on terror. And um, we, we, you know, those documents and those initiatives are really so good and we have to, uh, we have to keep them keep them alive and and try our best to try to implement them. Um, I, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Science for Peace as well has a very strong statement on NATO, Canada out of NATO, NATO should be abolished. Um, and, and I just want to go back to something that somebody had said earlier, just to remind everyone that it's because of Canada's membership in NATO that we are not, that Canada is not going to sign on to the new UN treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Um, so this is another reason why VOW is opposed to NATO is because NATO is entrenching uh, nuclear weapons into our national security systems and it's, it's, it's hugely problematic. Um, and uh, somebody mentioned in the, chat about some conversion uh, plans and policies that are out there. So there's a document called uh, Weapons to Windmills about nuclear weapons conversion. That's excellent. The campaign against the arms trade in the UK has a conversion plan that came out in 2014 called Arms to Renewables. It's really fantastic. Uh, Canada doesn't have any recent documents about how we might proceed with conversion, we would really love to, to have that. We just have really limited capacity in the peace movement to, to do something like that. But we are going to have a conversation about uh, a Green New Deal and conversion on May 29th. There's more information on the World Beyond War website. So there's a list of webinars that are taking place May 28th, May 29th, and May 30th. And one of them is dealing with shutting down uh, arms fairs. And another one is dealing with conversion. So I invite you to look at the website for more details about that. And also to mention maybe now to everybody that VOW is part of a steering committee that's having a big national conversation on revitalizing the Canadian peace movement on Sunday, May 31st from 4 until 6 p.m. And I'll uh, send the link for that. There's a survey that you can fill out in advance. We really want to try to unite everyone and to build a really strong and effective unified national peace and anti-war movement. So we need your involvement. We need your ideas. Please try to come to the meeting, the Zoom meeting on uh, May 31st, and I'll put up more details on the chat about that, thanks. Um, can I just come back to, to two things? So just building on what um, Tamara said, in terms of conversion resources, there's also a paper in the UNODA occasional paper series, so Tamara already posted the link to that. Um, so in addition to the piece on feminism that I wrote with Madeline, there's also one on, on conversion, and there's another piece from Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK. So uh, uh, everyone's in there. Um, and then the other point about um, NATO being the reason that Canada hasn't joined the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is very true. Um, and also, I don't know if any of you saw, but there was some discourse in Germany um, amongst different political parties around Germany's hosting of nuclear weapons um, recently in the last couple of weeks. And the Social Democrats and others were um, raising concerns about nuclear sharing and also the cost of replacing the, the bombers um, and that has gotten a swift reaction from NATO officials as well as from US officials trying to shut that discourse down um, and put pressure um, on the government to uh, not entertain any thoughts about uh, getting rid of nuclear, the US nuclear weapons that are hosted by Germany. So that is all unfolding as we speak, but interesting to watch also in thinking about um, how uh, 
how this is a, sin, is, um, a signal to other NATO members not to rock the boat as well. Um, so I'm sure that Trudeau is watching that carefully too. Not that he's ever thinking about getting rid of nuclear weapons, it seems, but uh, if he was, he's watching that and, and hearing that. Uh, yes. Um, so we have two hands that have been raised. Um, try and keep them to quick questions. We'll do another five minutes or so to give some time for those two questions and responses. And then we'll do closing remarks. And I will make sure to send everyone that registered, um, as well as a few other people that I know that are on here, all the details from today, from the chat, from the resources from t uh, Ray and Tamara and everyone. So well, everyone will get. Uh, so uh, Margaret, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't really have a question so much as just a comment to build on what's been said. Okay. I think that um, <clears throat> in opposing NATO, one thing is important to keep in mind is that it's a US basically dominated organization whose commander in chief is always a US uh, top official. And I don't think there's anybody more subservient right now that we can see to the US in every sphere of endeavor than Canadian government. That's just the way it is. And we need to keep in mind that there is so much disinformation used to try and convince us that we have no other option but to basically follow what, what NATO in this case is doing led by the US. And in particular, I think it's very important that this whole emphasis on that they're defending human rights, they're defending democracy around the world in whether it's on a Cold War basis that China and Russia now have to be considered the, the enemies that we have to defend against, which means a lot of weapons, or if it means simply violating the UN Charter and interfering everywhere that the US decides people's governments have to be pushed aside. And even if Canada on the surface talks like it's for peace and for transition on a peaceful basis, they, they are preparing the path for the US to do the most brutal, whether it's a mercenary type war or whether it's conventional weapons. I think these are all important things to take into account so that we can actually, with confidence, push forward that this whole rotten business is something we have to oppose, not only in its weapon systems, for sure, in the spending, but the, uh, the justifications, I think, that are being put forward, which are more and more pretty perverse. That's my point for today. Thank you. Any comments on that, Tamara Ray? <laughs> I totally agree, 100%. NATO is dictated and dominated by the United States, and it has been engaged in so many illegal military interventions that it is just, its time is up. It, we have no more use for NATO. It's totally undermined peace and security in the entire world, and it's, and it's globalizing. It needs to stop. It's militarizing the world. We need to get out of it. Yeah. Taking, and we need away to end the, it. taking away the resources we need. Oh. Yes. Um, so we have another hand up from Pamela. If you would like to unmute yourself and, or, and come on, there we go. Oh, all right. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say something about how uh, it all intersects. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, issues of colonialism and resource exploitation and how indigenous peoples are really uh, just so brutally repressed. And so even though they doesn't look, you know, they're this international military uh, organization, they're getting these materials to build these weapons from indigenous people's lands. And I think we need to keep our, um, our awareness and keep talking about this. And I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Um, no, complete, I completely agree. Yes, um, the most affected communities by nuclear weapons and military industrial complex have absolutely been indigenous communities. And now we are seeing also in the midst of, of this crisis, um, that they are disproportionately harmed by COVID-19 as well um, due to historic injustices and lack of access to healthcare. Um, and so we're seeing, for example, in New, in New Mexico, um, the Navajo Nation is about 11% of the population but, of the state, but it is, I think, 
50% of the deaths and 60% of the confirmed cases. It's just astronomical numbers. Um, and so it's, it's um, important, of course, to, to pay attention to the ways that all of these things intersect, which is why I think the, the writing that's been done and the, the movement building that's been done around the Red Deal in, in coordination with the Green New Deal is so vital to keep decolonization um, in our minds uh, and in our actions uh, and in centering the lived reality of, of indigenous uh, communities um, in, in our work. And so ICANN has tried to do that in, on nuclear weapons, but there's so much more that needs to be done in, that, um, in our work against militarism more broadly as well. Um, I think, oh, the, other, the one thing that's not related to this, but I did want to raise um, that I forgot to mention in the context of, of other comments around education and outreach and, and information that's being made available in this time, um, I wanted to highlight the, the WILP blog series that we've been doing um, around COVID-19. Some of you may have seen it. Um, but we have a lot of pieces on militarism, um, but we also have um, a variety of other issues that are covered um, related to political economy more broadly and solidarity and care economies and um, domestic violence and other issues. So um, there's a lot of great pieces up there um, that we'd love for, for folks to read and share uh, amongst your networks. So I can post that link in the chat as well. Thanks. Um, I I would like to add to what Ray said and encourage everyone to read her latest article on military bases and the virus and violence. It's absolutely an exceptional piece and it's on the blog that she referred to with Reaching Critical Will. We'll send the link out to it and maybe she could speak a little bit more about uh, that article. But I'd like to go back and just really quickly say something about militarism and indigenous peoples. The largest domestic deployment of the military in Canada was against indigenous people, the Mohawk, um, during the Oka crisis. And, uh, you know, just to remind you that our paramilitary force, the RCMP, you know, were deployed against the, the Wet'suwet'en people in their blockade against the coastal gas leak pipeline, uh, you know, earlier this year. Um, and the military bases in this country uh, are on indigenous land. And there have been, if you look at the history, there have been uh, many conflicts with indigenous people, uh, with the Canadian government, expropriating indigenous land to create military bases and the military bases in this country are are highly contaminated uh, you can look at the federal contaminated sites inventory you know these military bases are used in this country to plan for war to practice war to test weapons to to uh, store weapons um, you know, uh, the, the Canadian Department of National Defense is the largest land holder in this country, and many of those sites, as I explained, are uh, highly contaminated, and they're on Indigenous land, and the Indigenous people would like, you know, this land uh, recovered. So uh, that, that's another link between uh, militarism and Indigenous people in Canada, but there's there's many more issues to say. Oh, one, one other thing that I'd like to just add really quickly too is that the Canadian government is especially target, targeting Indigenous people to recruit for the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, so there's a, a huge recruiting drive that the Liberals launched in 2017 uh, with their new defense policy, and they're targeting uh, minorities, indigenous people, and women. They're trying to meet the target of 25% women in the Canadian Armed Forces by uh, 2025. Right now, they're at about 14%. We don't want any, anyone to, uh, anyone, women, men, anyone to uh, join the Canadian Armed Forces, resist, don't enlist. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, we will now go into some actions uh, that we can do. Um, if Ray, if you have any, uh, well, you've, you've shared some actions. Um, if you have any other campaigns or actions that you would like to quickly share 
and, and do like a closing statement with that? Um, sure. Well, we didn't really get to the to the military bases. I'm sorry about that. I know that we wanted to come back to that, but I've posted the link to the blog there. And um, the main action there is to support um, the local, mostly feminist groups who have long been campaigning against military bases in their communities um, for all the reasons that are outlined in that blog um, to support their calls for the abolition of foreign military bases. And it's, it's predominantly, this is predominantly a U.S. problem when it comes to foreign bases because the U.S. has about 800 foreign military bases around the world um, and no other country has anywhere near that many. Um, and so uh, there's uh, an international coalition that is working on that issue uh, right now. Um, the links to that are provided in the blog. Um, so, and I know uh, World Beyond War and others are very involved in that work. So um, certainly supporting that. Um, there's a lot to do um, in addition to the actions around military spending and militarism that we talked about earlier. I think um, specifically on nuclear weapons, there's also um, a lot of great actions to be undertaken. And I can post a link to another blog about that with some, with some resources there, but um, there's lots that, that we can do even in this moment when we're stuck at home, um, getting our cities to join the I Can Cities Appeal to support the treaty, um, doing advocacy to get more ratifications for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, and uh, working to divest our funds from, from nuclear weapon producing companies is so important and so vital right now. And we all have this, this uh, entry point to really talk to um, our, our friends and family and neighbors and our banks and pension funds and whatever other financial institutions you're involved with to talk to them about um, nuclear weapon spending in this moment of, of coronavirus. So I think there's, there's lots to, lots to do. Um, so yeah, we'll get you these links and, and hopefully can connect up on some of those actions. Thank you. Um, Tamara, do you have some from your networks and doings for this coming up or anything, webinars and campaigns? And Well, I just want to encourage everyone on the call to, to speak to your member of parliament, to speak to your senator, uh, if you're involved in a political party, to talk to the leader and to your you know, colleagues about the problems with NATO and that Canada needs to get out of NATO and we need to abolish NATO. Um, I, 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 really think that, I, I really think that we can do it. Um, if you look at the polls in Europe, public support for NATO is dropping rapidly. And uh, I think that if we work together, you know, we can really, you know, we, we can do it. We can get Canada out of NATO and signing up to the new treaty to ban nuclear weapons. So I, I'm convinced that if we want a Green New Deal, if we want a, a Red Deal, if we want to decarbonize, if we want to de colonize, we, we absolutely have to demilitarize. We have to be able to, to, to say, uh, to include demilitarization. That's absolutely uh, critical. And then I just want to invite everybody again to the May 31st meeting, revitalizing the Canadian peace movement. We're also planning a call on Monday, uh, June 15th, I believe, and Rob Atchison and the Toronto uh, nuclear disarmament group are planning a call to strategize on how we can get Canada to join the treaty to uh, to prohibit nuclear weapons. So all of those details will come on the email that we'll send to you uh, after this call. We really appreciate your participation. It's so wonderful to see friends and allies across the country and in the United States. It's really great that you were all able to join today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, now I hand it back over to Vanessa um, to give us updates from what Bao is doing. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, thank you to our speakers. That was incredible. Um, and thank you to everybody joining us today and your thoughtful questions and comments. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate the hope that Ray Atchison talked about on our increased scrutiny on our budget and encourage all of us to spread awareness uh, on our tax dollar spending of the military and what we could be spending our money on to secure a peaceful future for all. 
I know we are all living in unprecedented times. And if you look at the incredible efforts and the movement of information, money, and labor in this health crisis, we can do this for other issues too. We are doing things unthinkable that three months ago, which means we can replicate this mobilization and do incredible things for the climate, for peace, for housing, the elimination of poverty, among so many other things to keep people healthy, happy, and safe. Uh, so if you would like to uh, con continue and follow us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of our social media handles are Vow Peace. We have also just opened up our nominations for Peace Awards to recognize outstanding women in five areas of peace activism. All of the eligibility and information is on our website. We also have a monthly newsletter, including so many informative webinars by us and our incredible partners. And finally, we, we are a membership funded organization and would not be able to continue our work without our dedicated members who support us. I see some of you on here, so I'd like to take a rare chance and say thank you by video. Um, if you would like to join our network, please go to our website, www.vowpeace.org, and click the Join, Renew, Donate button to become a member. And if you would like to make a donation, we currently have our matching campaign where your donation is matched by one of our generous members and your impact is doubled. Um, I also hope to see our VOW members later on for our Cross Canada meet and greet later on tonight where we, we will uh, get to know each other better and network and continue our conversation about the peace movement. And I'm looking forward to the revitalization of the Canadian peace movement happening on May 31st. That's amazing. And hopefully we can see everyone back here for our future No to NATO and Yes to Peace webinars. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vanessa. I will do some closing words to end us off and then that'll be it. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. As the weather here, at least in Southern Ontario, goes back to sunny and getting warm, watching the seeds grow we planted a few weeks ago and trying to work through this new reality that is shifting. We come together to talk about these tragic events to remember that we are safe here, can make more action here, can influence more here. We have privilege in our homes and computers. We have space to grow and feed ourselves. We remember the ones affected by war and climate change that don't have these privileges. We work today and always to make everyone have equal privileges and meet the needs for everyone to survive happily. Please take these words with you now as we go into our worlds. We will follow up with all the resources and links to the YouTube video. I hope to see some of your faces tonight and back on the streets in the future. Thank you, enjoy your days, think of each other, be empathetic and safe. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Thank thanks you. so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. so bye. It really was excellent. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. It, Thank you very much. And nobody is more knowledgeable or militant than Tamara no. and Ray. They are right on top of it. Yes. Yes. Spread Thank the you. word through Facebook. Thank you. And we're right behind you. We okay. <laughs> nobody wants to leave. <laughs> there will end. Greetings from Burlington, Vermont. Oh. Wonderful. Wow. Okay.